in life, we need a certain regularity. Are our brains connected like that so that we look for certain regular patterns, regular conditions? Hello and welcome to Idioms of Normality on Future Framed TV, the podcast series of Traces Dreams. I'm your host, Paul Mason, and I'm joined today by Yensi Flores. Several oceans away. Yensi, welcome. Hi, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us. Before we jump in with the question, what is normal, tell us a bit about yourself. Tell us about the experiences and the perspectives you bring to this strange and unusual but normal question. My name is uh, Yensi Flores Bueso, and I'm originally from Honduras, which is a small country in Central America near the Caribbean. We have very nice beaches and mountains and nature. It's a very rich and biodiverse country. And then I moved for my studies to Ireland, where I live uh, currently. I live in the beautiful city of Cork, which is in the south of Ireland, where I think uh, the nicest people in the world live. And I am here a researcher in the Cancer Research Center at University College Cork. I did my master's and PhD degree here. So I guess that what I can bring to your show is different perspective from someone who has lived in a developing country and in a developed country and has pursued research in both countries. And research into? I'm a cancer researcher but I do more synthetic biology, molecular biology too. I'm starting to do some protein design and uh, microbiome analysis or mi microbiome studies. Oh, I'm so interested in uh, particularly that last one, microbiome research, but I don't want to get sidetracked too early. Yancy, what is normal? So Paul, since you asked that question, I have been given it a bit of thought. And I was actually writing kind of in my agenda. So what is normal? And then, of course, the first thoughts of, of, of the normal cure appears in my mind, you know. So normal exists if there is a population that you can sample, right? And get like what is the most common features that you see in that population, depending on the question you ask. So I then started wondering. And uh, yeah, you see, maybe... This kind of person that actually looks into things in a, in like different perspectives and started thinking like, well, normal for us is just like a picture of like time and uh, space, you know, we need like a picture of time and space because all is ever changing, like universally, you know, I guess that the norm will be change because uh, if we think of how the universe work, the universe work or nature works, everything is constantly in change. So if you want to get like the most common feature of like something, you need to take like a picture in time and space to actually get what's normal. Otherwise there is no normal. You can have a more clean and uh, controlled setting to test, you know, and that's what we do with the statistical test. We kind of try to control every variable, you know, and uh, everything. So I would imagine that that is that. But I mean, there is a need and like a purpose of having a bit of testing and normality and getting like what's the most common thing in this uh, snapshot, you know. In, in the laboratory, you can control your variables and you have to control variables in order to run an experiment to test a hypothesis. You, you control group, I should say. And then you've got the variables that you manipulate mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. that you're testing it against the control group yeah. to see whether or not your hypothesis is correct or incorrect. But then that makes sense in the laboratory and normal makes sense within that rubric, that framework. But it, normality lacks ecological validity. It doesn't make sense as soon as you're you're in the messiness of everyday life as soon as you're in the the chaos and confusion yes. of non-laboratory life it, it it doesn't make yes. sense walk us through an experiment what yeah what what is a control group what is the test group what are the variables you've got dependent variables you've got confounding variables walk us through an experiment 
oh, I have to control for the variables and, uh, you know, test uh, for, in my case, most of the experiments that I do, I have uh, controls for each variable that I am putting in. And then I have a population sample, you know, a sample, which is never a population because I never get to do such big experiments. Uh, but then in this sample, you you add a factor and you try to see whether including this factor has an effect in change of the population, you know, if uh, the, uh, this factor changes factors in your population. So what you see is a shift of uh, of change, you know. Yeah, okay. So as a as someone who's currently studying cancer, you're looking at uh, healthy cells and cancer cells? Well, cancer cells, usually, let's say, very common one, it's a cancer cell, you put a drug in, which is whatever treatment you're you're putting into the cells, and you see whether this treatment makes the cells uh, less viable or more viable in comparison to cells that are never exposed to this treatment. I think scientists in the laboratory are much more modest about extrapolating from small sample sets, right? I think yes. scientists in laboratories know, well, this drug worked under these conditions for these cells. It, it, it had an effect, or whether that was positive or negative. Uh -huh. yeah. it had some kind yeah. of effect under these conditions. Mm -hmm. and, and yet it's so easy to take that outside the laboratory and the non-expert then might take that idea in, in a direction which oh, yes. the scientist is much more sober about and the scientist says well hang on <laughs> we need to do other kinds of tests under different kinds of conditions in order for that that scientific idea to have ecological validity which is the validity in in the real world and applicability in moving objects who are not who are constantly exposed to a flurry of of different kinds of uh, chemicals and uh, temperatures and climate conditions, etc. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, we we cannot like uh, we should not. This uh, actually should not happen. You know that we cannot say oh because something worked in cancer cells in, in my plates in the lab. I can assume that this will work in a human being. No, there's a timeline for that. You know, the, the, there's rigorous studies that have to be done in this different models before anything can be proved effective. And uh, I found that there's a lot of misinformation, you know, uh, about this. And, uh, well, you know, COVID was, uh, was a clear example, you know, of how much misinformation there was out, like uh, use this drug or use this, or th this one person says this, and it's, uh, it's not possible. I mean, cancer research is, is certainly one area of research where for, to my mind, it's making us question our notion of what a gene is. For, for decades, and for, uh, for decades, geneticists have been looking for a gene for cancer, and they're starting to realize, no, it's not. It's not as simple as one gene for a disease. It's much more complicated. And to my mind, that questions the very notion of what a gene is at its conceptual core, because things are getting turned on, things are getting turned off. There's this interplay between genes and regulatory factors. I mean, it's it's such a fascinating area of research that you're working in. It is. It is. Uh, it's biology, you know. It's redundant, messy, and uh, and so smart. <laughs> in some ways, especially in, in fields like biomedical science, in the laboratory, you're working with uncertainty. You're you're manipulating variables to determine what works what doesn't work and you're an artist in many ways of, of probability in the sense that you're changing the variables changing the probabilities having a look what what changing these things does and coming up with results but those results work under particular conditions to go to the next step then you have to have animal testing and then you go to phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four trials. Exactly. And, and you're yeah. an expert in one part of that equation. And then there's a whole <laughs> process of different scientists. Yes. Different yes. Fields. I mean, for me, my interest is about normality. And, and normality is this concept that escaped laboratory conditions and made it into the real world and, and somehow has really hijacked the modern mindset in some ways. People are 
whether they realize it or not, people are obsessed with normality. They're obsessed with presenting it to others. They're obsessed about acquiring it for themselves. They're obsessed about other holding other people accountable for it uh, and, and betrothing people to normality. Otherwise, they will uh, dig, uh, put them down or or put them into categories that people might not necessarily want to be put into. And so, there's a lot of harm that can be done when when very specific scientific concepts which have high cultural value. We hold, we hold science in high esteem, but then it makes its, its way into society. And in some ways, when these ideas make it out into society and then don't prove to have any, any uh, ecological validity, when they don't prove to have efficacy in the real world, then we blame it on the science. We don't blame it on the translation of science into wider society. I really am, am wondering if there is such a thing as normal, even in the laboratory, I'm wondering if there's such a thing as normal. I guess the concept of uh, normal that we adopted is kind of, uh, if I was thinking about it, like why do we come up with this concept of normal? And it's uh, why is it so relevant to us humans? And then I was thinking, what about other species? Is life looking for normality? And then I saw like, okay, maybe other organisms uh, which have a lifespan, a defined lifespan, they evolve to adapt to conditions, you know, within that lifespan of the environmental and surrounding conditions in, in that um, time and space, you know, within that time and space. So maybe it's kind of something of how life works and it's kind of ingrained of how we regulate ourselves uh, like organisms, right? uh to kind of adapt to our our environment i'm I'm, I'm gonna be so that's i'm gonna be a bit i'm not argumentative but i'm I'm gonna push back i'm I'm not convinced by that i'm not convinced by that i think organisms are opportunistic they're constantly exploring their environment they're they're exploring other options they you know like i think i don't think they're i don't think i don't see other organisms searching for normality in the laboratory we think of things like normal conditions and then we look at normal conditions what does what does normal conditions mean like, average average sorry? conditions yeah, like, it's but, average but conditions. even that's constructed right it's it's either 22.5 yeah. degrees or 24.5 degrees a certain amount of humidity a uh, certain amount of sunlight for so many hours a day like laboratory conditions are constructed and to call that normal conditions i think then uh, deceives us a bit about <laughs> normality being objective when really it's it's a it's a social construction within a, a laboratory or mm. clinical environment yeah i would say more regular conditions you know but uh but it would i don't know for example i i i feel these like seasons for example the duration of season that the the lapse of temperate temperature change you know and humidity let's say in an ecosystem uh, obviously, it won't be a lab, you know. But uh, so we're redundant. Life is redundant and can uh, somehow adapt as movie. But if you make like big changes, then you have extinctions, you know. Because if if you remove a species, if you make a big change in temperature, uh, something like that. And uh, I guess that's uh, something ingrained in in life. I don't know that we need kind of a, a certain uh, living um, regularity or something like that? Or like is our, our brains connected like that so that we look for certain regular patterns, uh, regular conditions? Yeah. Do we think like that? Yeah, I'm convinced by that for sure. You know, the, the human brain, for example, is, is definitely a pattern-seeking and pattern constructing machine Mm -hmm. and i think many of the patterns it finds are not necessarily natural patterns in the in the world prior to the existence of a brain some of those patterns emerge because there is a brain looking at it there is a brain perceptually categorizing colors into different categories Mm -hmm. when we could have discriminated between those color boundaries at at different points in the in the color spectrum it's just that the 
the three color receptors that we have in our eyes deciding, okay, we're going to sort them out this way. And even culturally, we know that different cultural groups don't necessarily sort it out into the, in, in, into the same categories. And yet, we do see the pattern seeking. And there is something mm-hmm. about normality that I think is seductive in that equation because normality gives us this idea that the patterns we seek are natural. The patterns we seek are, you know, oh, there is such a thing as this objective idea of normality when the whole construction of the equation of normality is a cultural artifact as well. I believe that. I, I just wonder, you know, I, because I do have like this very wandering mind. So when I was thinking about that, I was thinking like, what would be normal for like a sequoia tree or one of those trees in California that are like 4,000 years old, you know? Like, geez, all that has happened on this time. Like, what's like, uh, what's what? What would they, you know, feel of the world, you know, of their environment in those like really changing last four thousand years? But, but are, there, <laughs> are there other words that would be more constructive to use in that question? Like, uh, rather than saying what is the normal conditions for the sequoia tree, what are the conditions that allow the sequoia tree to thrive? What are the conditions that challenge uh the sequoia's tree the, the sequoia tree's ability to adapt uh what are the conditions that uh compromise the reproductive potential of the sequoia tree i think there's there's other questions that are much more constructive to ask and sometimes putting the word normal in there can actually be limiting in the way in which we think about the sequoia tree sensing its environment, interacting with its environment, uh, mm-hmm. or thriving within an environment. In some ways, if if we're running into difficulties with these words outside the laboratory, does that mean that we should perhaps check in with how we're using these words in the laboratory in the first place? Yeah. What questions do you think we should ask about normality? I would say that we should challenge all these beliefs of normality and uh, challenge why we believe that something is normal, you know? Uh, I mean, I understand that there's a social contract of uh, things that we should do as a society to cooperate, but uh, as a Honduran uh, that uh, has challenged every, like, uh, normal Thing that was meant to be for me, you know, uh, even their religious beliefs, my role as a woman, the career choice that I made, and uh, even living outside of my own country and my family. It's uh, it's good, I think, challenging. Like, why are these core beliefs, you know? Like, why do I have to do this? Why is a why if I'm a woman, this is my role? And who says that? Is there like a law that says, you know, um, this is wrong and will be, um, you know, you, you'll go to jail to do this, you know? Uh, then, then there's no normal unless, like, you know, we break the law or like harm some other or, um, organism or like human being. We should question everything that we do. Like, uh, is it that we're like just following a trend, or are we being uh, unique and well, kind of original in following whatever we really want in in thinking and asking ourselves who we really are and uh, being truthful to that. You know, when when I listen to that, my mind distills it into the question that we should challenge the patterns that we have become accustomed to. Because we can become accustomed and be truthful to, to ourselves, like, like uh, you know, ask ourselves who we really are and be truthful to who we really are. Yancy, thank you so much for being a very important pattern breaker in 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 this field that you're working in. <laughs> and thank you so much for the time and for joining us on Idioms of Normality. I've really valued your time and thank you so much for having this fun conversation about what is normal. Great. Very good to talk to you, Paul.